What does a volunteer doctor in Tacloban, Philippines actually do? Working around the city that was devastated by Typhoon Haiyan 10 years ago. You may find it fascinating, <laughs> you may find it disturbing, you may find it funny, but I hope it inspires you to do something similar, whether you're a doctor or not. I was initially only gonna do one video in this series about my volunteering in the Philippines, but it's turned out to be one of the most popular videos in the series. So I felt like I had to share some more stories about what's been going on here. And I'm really excited to share this video because I think I may have found some answers which I've been searching for when I set out on this trip. Now two weeks have passed since that first video and I've got some more crazy stories to tell you about. Like I said, we're staying in Tacloban City, but we're working in all the rural villages around the city. So last week we went to the main clinic in Babat Nom, and on the day that we arrived there, the doctor who I've been working with was seeing a patient. And they consult not in private rooms, but kind of like in the open area space. And I noticed that this lady looked really short of breath. So she was puffing really hard. So I turned to the doctor and I asked her, what's going on with this lady? She looks really out of breath. And apparently she had had chest pain, shortness of breath, and cough for the past eight days. Now, most of my experience is in emergency medicine, and seeing this lady out of breath like that did raise some alarm bells for me, and it did make me slightly concerned. So I asked the nurses to put on a O2 oxygen sats monitor. Her oxygen saturations were normal, but she was very tachycardic, which basically means her heart rate heart rate was very fast. It was between 110 and 120. After seeing this really fast heart rate, the doctor and I looked at each other and we're like, this lady could potentially be quite sick. She needs to go to hospital. So the way it works here is they have drivers who drive ambulances, but they're not paramedics. So they have no medical experience. So we call the driver who pulls up in the ambulance. We don't really know what the diagnosis is. Uh, the doctor thinks is, is thinking this is possibly an MI. I personally have a different opinion. She had the chest pain for eight days already. She was tachycardic and short of breath. And she was also complaining of pleuritic chest pain. So pain when you take a deep breath in and that was raising alarm bells for pulmonary embolism for me so my fiance loads her up into the ambulance and for some reason we're just sitting in the ambulance not moving anywhere and i'm kind of questioning why are we just waiting here and it turns out that we're waiting we're trying to get hold of the husband so he can accompany the patient to hospital we can't get hold of him so we get hold of the daughter instead via facebook messenger and she turns up after about 20 minutes i was thinking why can't we just go to the hospital without someone else to come with her she could be quite sick she ne needs to be in the hospital ASAP. And apparently hospitals won't actually accept patients unless they have someone to accompany them, which kind of blew my mind. Anyway, we start our journey to the hospital. This is when, when it gets kind of scary. Now the hospital is about 45 minutes away usually, but this driver, this driver was driving like he was in the Fast and Furious movies. Honestly, he was doing about 160 kilometers an hour. And usually when I take these roads, I'm doing it about 40 kilometers an hour, basically driving four times as fast, winding down all these narrow roads, beeping traffic to get out of the way. It was actually a terrifying experience. <laughs> and I remember thinking the whole time, I really don't want to die in this ambulance. We we're all sitting in the back, like no, no seat belts, no nothing. But eventually we made it to the hospital. We unloaded the patient and handed over to the nurses there. And once we'd done a handover, we let the doctors in the main big hospital take over. We hopped back in the ambulance to go back to the clinic. And for some reason, the driver still felt the need to drive at 160 kilometers down these windy roads. I honestly thought I was gonna throw up with my eyes closed, just trying to hold back the vomiting. But yeah, I'm not too sure what happened to that patient. I suspect she had something semi-serious, potentially a pulmonary embolism, which is uh, a clot in the lungs. But the main thing that really took me back was that patients need someone to accompany them to the hospital. And in fact, the doctor I've been working with told me a story of a young man, probably about 30, who had got in a, in a road traffic accident. Now this young man had got in an accident and been taken to hospital, but the hospital couldn't initiate treatment until his family arrived. And unfortunately his family couldn't make it for another 24 hours. So he just sat in the hospital without receiving treatment. And the patient actually died in hospital waiting for his family to arrive. And I think stuff like that would happen a lot more in developed countries like Australia or UK if we had to wait for the family to arrive. In fact, it just wouldn't work at all because there's so many isolated people, so many lonely old people. If these flies are literally trying to find my eyes. There's so many isolated, lonely old people that if they became sick, there wouldn't be anyone to accompany them to the hospital. It kind of works in the Philippines because because of such a community feel, everyone knows everyone. They have such a family-oriented way of living. And in, in fact, there's actually something really cool they have here in each barangay, which is kind of like a little area, a little village. They have something called a barangay captain. And he knows all the families in the area. He knows where they live. So if they were trying to find a patient's family, they could quite easily find the family through the captain. And yeah, it just kind of highlights one of the main differences between Philippines and more developed countries is that community feel, which we're definitely lacking where I'm from. One, two, three, and... 
Now, apart from being at the main clinic, we've been touring the whole region, going to all these rural villages. And we're pretty independent now. We've, we're just told where to go. We hop on our motorcycle and just drive to the clinic and meet the usually midwife who's working there. And again, it's been quite challenging because I, I don't have another doctor to support me. So I'm working independently, seeing patients with my fiance, who's not a doctor, by the way, she's a scientist. But there's certain conditions coming in, coming in that I just don't really have a clue how to treat. And of course, it's quite under-resourced in the sense they don't have the medicines that I'd usually give back home. One huge example is actually something called salbutamol or Ventolin. You might have seen it, usually a little blue inhaler that we give to asthmatics. They don't have that treatment here. And in fact, they use oral salbutamol, which is a swallowed version of the inhaler, which I actually didn't even know existed because we never use oral salbutamol back in Australia, back in UK. And in fact, there's some guidelines which state that it's not a very suitable treatment for asthma. But the alternative is they don't have any treatment. So I have just been giving oral, oral salbutamol, which yeah, has been a bit of a learning curve for me. And in fact, in some places, it's not just medicines they're lacking. They're just lacking basic things like dressings or gloves. So we had this guy come in who had chopped his finger uh, whilst he was cutting some vegetables. Thankfully, he had just cut the pulp of his finger. So not through the nail, just the uh, t kind of tip of the finger, just on the skin. He didn't need a washout in theatre, but he did need a washout. But because there's no running water, it's kind of difficult to do. And in fact, the running water isn't the cleanest. So we ended up using water from the water dispenser in a jug and just poured it over his finger. And then I asked if they had any steri strips. It didn't really need sutures, but it definitely needed closing. And steri strips are like a st strong sticky tape which close a wound. But of course they didn't have any steri strips. I asked if they had a dressing. Of course they didn't have a dressing. So we ended up just using some gauze and wrapping it up with some tape. But he seemed pretty happy with the outcome and it seemed to have done the trick. For some reason they only had one one set of latex gloves. So after doing that procedure, I didn't really have any more gloves to examine patients. Just had to go bare unsanitized hands, which wasn't ideal. We haven't just been doing work. We have had time for some leisure activities as well. The weekend just gone, we hopped on our motorbike and drove down to South Leyte and did some fun waterfall exploring. Went for a swim, did some backflips. You know how it is. And on the way back, it's quite a long drive, it's like four hours. We wanted to stop off at a beach to cool off in the sea. I get into my trunks and go for a swim. When I come out, I see my missus has been completely swarmed by Filipino people. And then when they see me, they also decide to swarm me too. And I kind of had a realization in this moment. If you want to feel famous like Justin Bieber, step one, go to the Philippines. Step two, be white. Now I've been to a lot of places in Asia and yes, I've had a lot of photographs, a lot of selfies taken with us, but never have I ever had the reaction like we did in South Leyte. In fact, one of the older women there put her hand on my peck and took a photo with me. And I kind of felt violated. Nah, I'm not gonna lie. I kind of enjoyed it. I enjoyed the attention. It was quite funny. But then another older dude came in for some white guy action. And we kind of timed our trip here pretty well because this week has been foundation day celebrations, basically celebrating the creation of this municipality. It's a difficult word to say municipality and they had a few different events like pregnant lady beauty pageant where they have a beauty pageant for pregnant women and they give out prizes and also do some health education on how to look after themselves when they're pregnant and we got to take part in this massive parade where they just walk around the town we all were wearing matching t-shirts and it was really nice just to see everyone walking around in a big community together like that and then all the high schools in the area did a marching band performance which was actually really impressive twirling their sticks waving their flags playing the drums and yes it was all very loud thankfully i brought my earplugs because i would have been deafened otherwise and please filipinos if you're watching this please protect your ears i saw the kids smashing the drums no ear protection repeated exposure like that really isn't good for your long-term hearing and you'll go deaf at a young age so i wish there was a way to spread the message to filipinos just protect your ears i feel like there's probably not enough awareness here about it but yeah after the parade something happened which was actually quite scary so we just finished our lunch and we were sitting in the clinic and we see a massive gust of wind go by the window trees were blowing everywhere and it just started pouring it down it literally went from sunny ish weather to torrential downpour extremely high winds i was just sitting there like oh we're probably just gonna have to chill here for a bit wait for the rain to pass before we go home but actually the winds were so strong that it had blown down a tree just by the clinic and landed on two teachers one of the teachers was okay just a little bit shaken up but the other teacher had, had really injured her ankle so it looks like a fracture dislocation potentially to me and of course we needed to send her to hospital so I just put it in a splint and again we called the driver to take her to the nearest hospital it's quite 
a scary experience when that weather changed just so suddenly like that. There was a massive power cut. Things were just blowing around everywhere. The tent outside the clinic had just been completely destroyed. And it kind of gave me a small taste of tropical typhoon weather. And by small, I mean very, very small taste. It was, it happened so quickly when it was over so quickly. And it kind of got me thinking, how have I not spoken about what happened here 10 years ago in Taklaban City? And I'm talking about Typhoon Haiyan, which just completely devastated this place. I'm gonna be honest, I was a little bit ignorant about what had actually happened here. I knew something had happened, but I didn't really know the extent of the damage and lives ruined and lost because of the typhoon. So from my understanding, there was 7,000 reported deaths, but speaking with the locals, a lot of them think the number is actually a lot higher, probably around 15 to 20,000. I was speaking to my homestay host who told me that after the typhoon, they didn't have electricity for six months. And in the immediate week just after, they literally had no food. All the people were looting the local supermarkets just to survive. But the crazy thing is that despite having no food, they would still share it all amongst themselves, all amongst the community. My homestay asked basically said that they'd get a sack of food and she would just give away half of it. And it kind of got me thinking, why is it the people who have the least are giving away the most? Now I want to tell you about something which has been a really weird coincidence for me. So before I came out here on this trip, I made a video for my social media accounts, including YouTube, about quitting my job to travel the world in order to learn how to live a healthier and happier life. And the theme of that video was kind of inspired by the movie, The Secret Life of Walter Mitty. And I said I was quite ignorant about the typhoon that happened here, but I was doing some research and I came across a video and it was a video by one of my favorite YouTubers, Casey Neistat, I've talked about him before. And I didn't realize he'd actually come to Tacloban City 10 years ago to help the people here after the typhoon. And the reason he came was because the movie, The Secret Life of Walter Mitty, wanted him to make a trailer for the, the movie that was about to come out. But he had told them he didn't want to make a trailer for them. He wanted to come to the Philippines and help the people there. Now, I had no idea Casey had come to the Philippines, to this specific spot. And the funny thing is, he actually used the exact same music in his video that I had used in my video. Now, the whole theme of that video is how can I live a healthier, happier life? The whole theme of this video series, Behind the Scenes Weekly, is I've quit my job to travel the world, trying to learn how to live a healthier, happier life. I'm sitting there watching this video by Casey Neistat made 10 years ago, and I'm like almost in tears, seeing how badly devastated this place was. And it wasn't actually in the video, but it was underneath the video in the description. Basically, Casey wrote this, never have I met such people with the resilience of these typhoon victims. There was one thing that stuck out, one big, huge, tiny thing. That was of everyone we were face to face with, thousands of people, not once, at any time for any reason, did anyone complain. No one. Their focus was on rebuilding and healing, not sympathy. Actually, I could relate so hard to this. There's not a single Filipino person I've met here who's complaining. Despite some of them having what I would consider literally nothing in terms of material goods, they're never complaining. They have this kind of unwavering happiness. And in the process of me asking myself, how can I live a healthier, happier life? It kind of got me thinking the first step is just not complaining. Not complaining about my comfortable life where I have running water, I have electricity, my family isn't starving and in some natural disaster. And then also taking a leaf out of my homestay host book. If she can give away food when they have nothing to eat, maybe I should think about what I can give, whether that's my time, my skills, my resources. <laughs> and a decade later, these people still require assistance. So if you're interested in volunteering in this region of Taklaban City, please comment below or send me a DM via my Instagram and I'll send you some information, some content details of how you can get involved. I know for me personally, it's helped me answer my questions of how to live a healthier, happier life and it may help answer your questions too. Thank you for inspiring me, Philippines. I'll see you next week. Keep training, keep living. Peace.